to this event of the Presidential Forum on Education. We're so blessed and uh, privileged tonight to have uh, one of uh, America's most distinguished public intellectuals. Uh, and uh, Diane Ravitch's work in education has been nothing short of breathtaking. And talk about prolific, uh, amazing. I don't, we were saying at lunch today, how in the world do you write 20 great books? And uh, Diane uh, grew up in Houston, Texas. And, and uh, can you imagine the culture shock moving from public schools in Houston, Texas to Wellesley College and then to Columbia Teachers College for her PhD? Um, she's currently a research professor at NYU and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. We all know she was Assistant Secretary of Education uh, in the Clinton administration. And um, her most recent book, uh, which by the way she is happy to sign after her address this evening, and we have a number of copies up there, um, The Death and Life of the Great American School System how testing and choice are undermining education strikes a deep chord of resonance with those of us at Notre Dame who believe that the purpose of education is the full human flourishing of our children and the creation of citizens for this country and for heaven. And uh, so Diane is not one to understand and is a passionate advocate for us, all of us to embrace and understand that what we do as educators is sacramental. And uh, it's, uh, it's a deeply human and profoundly divine exchange. So welcome to Notre Dame, if you will, uh, a, a wonderful advocate for children, and who, by the way, comes with her great friend, uh, life friend and partner, Mary Butts. Mary, if you'll just uh, be recognized. Uh, welcome, Mary. Uh, Mary is a trustee of uh, St. Joseph's College in, uh, in New York, and uh, so welcome to uh, St. Joseph's uh, Spouses College here in Indiana. <laughs> Diane Ravitch, thank you. Well, thank, thank you so much to Notre Dame for inviting me. It's a great privilege to be talking about education at one of the nation's greatest institutions of education. I learned two wonderful phrases in the course of this day. One was when Father Tim described the teaching profession. He referred to, quote, the awesome dignity of this profession. That's a line that I'll remember and I'm sure I'll quote many times. And the other is I loved it when I heard about the Alliance for Catholic Education and they said that their mission was to prepare children for college in heaven. <laughs> I like that so much better than college and career ready. <laughs> Something totally non-utilitarian about it that appeals to me. Well, there is indeed a crisis in public education, but there's also a parallel crisis in Catholic education, and these are not unrelated events. I'm Jewish. Uh, but I have long-standing ties to Catholic education. I'm not counting the fact that I was born in St. Joseph's Hospital in Houston, Texas, or that I grew up next door to the Convent of the Good Shepherd in Houston. The nuns looked very mysterious to me, and I never met any of them. But now, as an adult, I have very dear friends who are nuns, and my closest friend, who's with me tonight, attended Catholic schools and colleges for 16 years. And she's brought me so often to Mass at the Oratory of St. Philip Neri in my neighborhood that the priests consider me a member of the parish. I'm even on the uh, envelopes that come for contribution. <laughs> that says that I'm really a member of the parish. I have sponsored students to attend Catholic high schools in New York. I hold an honorary degree from St. Joseph's College in New York, and just last May, I received an honorary degree from the Franciscan Friars uh, at Siena College in New York State, where I became, quote, a daughter of Siena, Siena College now and forevermore. So this evening, I will try to explain the seeming paradox, which is how can I be a strong advocate for both public schools and Catholic schools, because I am. Both of them are in peril 
and both of them, I believe, and this free society are needed. We need a vibrant public school system, and we need a strong and self-sufficient Catholic school system. As a historian of American education, I've written about the origins of both of them. Public education had its beginnings in the colonies of New England, as towns and communities recognized that they needed to pool their resources to educate their children. In the cities, community spirit was not so strong. Most children were taught by private tutors, or by a local private school, or by church schools, and the children of the poor were educated by charitable organizations. When large numbers of Irish Catholics arrived in the 1830s, the 1840s, the 1850s, urban public schools were just getting started. Typically, the students in the public schools recited from Protestant prayer books, they sang Protestant hymns, and they read passages every day from the King James Bible. Even the textbooks contained content about history that expressed Protestant views of history and of literature. And many Catholic clergymen felt uncomfortable about the Protestant nature of what was then considered public schools. My first book, The Great School Wars, which is a history of the New York City public schools, described the tumultuous events that led to the creation of a Catholic school system in New York City. A benevolent Quaker group, which was first called the Free School Society and then renamed itself the Public School Society, was funded by both the city and the state of New York to run free schools for poor children, many of whom were Catholic. When Bishop John Hughes of New York objected to the biased content in the textbooks, the Quaker leaders, who were trying to be fair, offered to put black marks over any material in the textbooks that he found offensive. While Bishop Hughes didn't want Catholic children to attend schools that were neutral towards religion, he wanted Catholic children to be educated in the Catholic faith. Bishop Hughes called on the city and the state to give equal funding to Protestant public schools and to Catholic public schools. And when they rejected his pleas, he determined to establish a Catholic school system. In 1844, Philadelphia was the scene of violent riots between Catholics and people who call themselves Native Americans or nativist. Nativist opposed Catholic demands for equal treatment in the schools, and they burned entire blocks of Catholic homes and three Catholic churches. Catholics defended their churches and schools, and martial law was declared in the city of Philadelphia. And by the time order was restored, nearly three dozen people had died, and property damage in the city was in the hundreds of millions of dollars, which in those days was a lot more than it is today. Well, in light of these events and the growing political power of the Know Nothing Party in the 1850s, the Catholic Church determined to build its own school system, and it did. The American public school system had a very different trajectory. Many public school systems were led by Protestant ministers who wanted to advance their own non-sectarian views, which they assumed to be universal. But the secularizing trends in American society eventually removed all traces of any religious influence from the schools. Public schools necessarily must be neutral because they enroll students of all faiths and students of no faith. In 1962, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that school prayer is unconstitutional even when the prayers are voluntary and non-denominational. The prayer that the Supreme Court found objectionable read as follows. Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee and we beg thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. Amen. Even so innocuous a prayer violated the Constitution, the justices said. At the same time, in the 1960s, the Catholic schools in the United States reached their zenith with an enrollment of 5.2 million students attending some 13,000 schools. However, that was their zenith. Catholic schools began a long, slow decline. By 1990, Catholic enrollment was down to 2.5 million. During the 1990s, enrollment stabilized and actually saw a small increase but the decline accelerated after 2000, and today there are about half as many Catholic schools as there were in the 1960s, some 6,800 in all, and the 5.2 million students who were in Catholic schools in the 1960s have now dropped to 2 million students, mostly in elementary and middle schools. And in some cities, the decline in Catholic schools has been even steeper than the national data, 
and we have become accustomed to hearing annual announcements about the next group of Catholic schools slated to consolidate or to close. Some advocates for Catholic education think that their salvation lies with vouchers or charters, and I don't agree. The greatest strength of Catholic schools is that they're Catholic. That is their raison d'etre. Catholic schools are faith-based. They have religious symbols in the classrooms and in the halls. Their teachers do not hesitate to speak about right and wrong and to appeal to God for help or pardon or mercy. Catholic schools are able to establish a clear, well-defined moral and ethical order. It is not an option. It is part of who they are and what they are and what they do. If a Catholic school becomes a charter school, it must remove all religious symbolism and religious content. It must stop being a Catholic school in order to get public money. This is no way to save Catholic education. If a Catholic school accepts vouchers, it gambles on the hope that government authorities in the future will not impose regulations that compromise its religious identity. And there is yet another threat that comes with vouchers. And that is that most proposals for vouchers at the state level say that they should be available only to students in failing schools. Do Catholic schools really want to become the last chance institution where public schools send their lowest performing students? This is a risky bargain. Like Catholic education, public education is in trouble, but for somewhat different reasons. Public education is under siege by a powerful movement that seeks to privatize many public schools and to deprofessionalize education. This movement seeks to introduce free market discipline and consumerism. Public schools and their teachers have been subject to relentless and harsh attacks in the past few years. This movement is very well funded. It has bipartisan support. It claims that our nation's public schools are a dismal failure, that American education is in decline, that low scores are caused by bad teachers, and that the solution to this morass of dysfunction is to close schools with low scores, open privately managed, deregulated charter schools, roll back collective bargaining, and strip teachers of any job protections so that they can be promptly fired for not producing those higher test scores that are valued. Our schools are a reflection of our society. They are indeed beset by problems, and they do indeed need to improve. But they are not declining, and they are not failing. Crisis talk is nothing new, as anyone who has studied the history of education would realize. For at least the past century, critics have claimed that our public schools were failing. A generation ago, a national commission warned that the failures of public education put our nation at risk. And they produced a report of that name, a nation at risk. And yet today, 30 years later, America has the world's largest economy. Today's reformers point to the fact that our students are just about average on international tests, and this is a scandal. But apparently they don't know that when the first international tests were given in the mid-1960s, our students came in 12 out of 12. <laughs> and they have never scored more than the international average. At that time, the critics said that the Soviets would beat us because of our terrible schools, yet they're gone and we're still here. Now, why is that? It's because we as a, as a society believe in individuality and creativity. We don't believe in centralized control and top-down planning, five-year plans. Do we have a dropout crisis? Hardly a day goes by without reference to the dropout crisis. Crisis usually means we're at a turning point. Things are worse than ever. In fact, if you look at the data, the graduation rates in American high schools are the highest today that they've ever been. They're the highest they've ever been for white students, black students, Hispanic students, low-income students, middle-income students, and high-income students. Is there a dropout crisis? Certainly it's not a crisis. Certainly we would like to see more children graduate from high school with a meaningful education, not just push through to go into remedial education when they get to a community college. But there is, in fact, not a dropout crisis. The context for today's reform movement is the federal law called No Child Left Behind, which was signed by President George W. Bush in January of 2002. Now, in the decade before the passage of No Child Left Behind, most states had already adopted testing and accountability systems. 
So for most of this country, for 20 years, testing and accountability have been our national education policy. This policy is the status quo, and our federal and state policymakers just can't seem to get enough data. They want more data. Unfortunately, they have grown addicted to data. They think the test scores are the only valid measures of education. And one of the reasons that I admire Catholic education is that it focuses on the full development of each child, intellectually, spiritually, physically, and morally, not just on their standardized test scores and how they rank compared to others. Catholic education seeks to find the reflection of God in every child. It aims to create good men and women with a sense of purpose and an awareness of their obligations to others. Of course, test scores do matter, but Catholic educators have always recognized that test scores are a measure. They are not the ultimate ends of education. In our present national discourse, we have lost sight of the ends of education. Our leaders tell us that we must think of children as global competitors, competing with all the children across the world for something or another, and all that counts is their test scores. And the best districts, they tell us, are the ones with the high scores, and the schools that can't produce higher test scores every year are stigmatized as failing schools. Well, NCLB mandates that 100% of all students must be proficient in math and reading by the year 2014. And so children must be tested every year in grades three through eight, moving presumably closer to that 100% goal. But this is an unreasonable target. It's one that no nation in the world has ever met and no state in this nation is even close to meeting. Any school that's not on track to meet the unreachable goal is a failing school and will face an escalating series of sanctions culminating in such punishments as firing the principal, firing half or all the staff, and closing the school. And CLB is devoted to punishment, not to support. By setting an impossible target, it creates failure. If a city has too much crime, we don't close police departments. We don't fire policemen. If a city has too many fires, we don't close down firehouses and fire firefighters. It hurts to close a Catholic school which is the means of transmitting the faith to a new generation, and it hurts to close a public school, which in many towns and villages and cities is the heart of the local community. No Child Left Behind has caused our nation's public school system to leave behind the ideals of good education as schools devote more and more time and resources to standardized testing, to preparing for standardized tests, to test prep, and less time to the arts, less time for physical education, less time for history and civics, for science, for foreign languages, for everything except testing. Tests should be used to diagnose learning problems and to help students, to help their teachers. Instead, they're now used inappropriately to judge the worth of the teacher, the worth of the student, and the worth of the school. And all of this, I believe, is wrong. Every test program administered in this nation and abroad shows that family income is the most reliable predictor of scores. Of course, children from poor families can learn and excel, but the odds are on the side of children who live in affluent and secure communities. Poverty is the elephant in the room. If we reduced poverty, test scores would increase. But we don't talk about that. We just talk about increasing test scores and who should be punished next. Standardized tests are not scientific instruments. They are not a yardstick, they're not a thermometer. The tests are social constructions. The scoring is objective, but the questions and answers are written by humans and subject to error. Sometimes the questions are wrong, sometimes there are two plausible answers. Sometimes the thoughtful student chooses an answer that's wrong because he or she thought too much. The tests are subject to statistical error, random error, human error, they should be used for information, not to reward or punish students, and teachers, and principals, and schools. Good education teaches you to ask questions, not just to pick the right bubble. A good education prepares you to reason and to wonder, not to respond with the right answer to programmed questions. And yet this regime of standardized testing is now the fulcrum of our nation's education policy. Standardized testing has become even more important because of 
the Race to the Top program. While NCLB holds schools accountable, Race to the Top holds teachers accountable for reaching ever higher test scores. This is now our national goal. Race to the top. I'm not sure why we're racing, and I don't even know what the top is. Races don't have lots of winners. They have a few winners and a lot of losers. Race to the top dangled $5 billion before the states to persuade them to award merit pay for higher test scores, to evaluate teachers by their students' test scores, to fire principals and teachers in closed schools that they couldn't raise test scores, and to open more privately managed schools receiving public funding. Many states, including Indiana, are now implementing the changes proposed in Race to the Top, even though they received no federal funding to do so. Indiana went even further and adopted vouchers. Other states, such as Louisiana, have also endorsed vouchers, enabling students to take public funds to religious schools. Louisiana estimates that some 2,000 children will be using vouchers, but they'll be open, opening dozens and dozens of new charter schools, as well as for-profit online charter schools, which have a terrible record. So I'd like to go through some of the evidence on these reforms. The high stakes use of tests, meaning using the test for punishments and rewards, has negative consequences that undermine the quality of education. High stakes testing encourages narrowing of the curriculum, teaching to the test, gaming the system, and cheating. We've seen all of this happen during the decade of No Child Left Behind. The cheating scandals in Atlanta, Georgia, implicated scores of educators who changed the scores of children from wrong to right. We know about them because the governor ordered an independent investigation. The cheating scandals in Washington, D.C. were revealed by USA Today a year ago, but they have never been subject to an independent investigation. The more our nation relies on high-stakes testing, the more our sense of educational priorities is warped by the test. What matters most in education, which we would say, or I would say, is love of learning, character, depth of understanding, cannot be posed as a multiple choice question. We don't know how to test the things that matter most. Last September, in a visit to Finland, I learned about their celebrated school system. For the past decade, their students have scored at or near the top of the international assessments in reading, mathematics, and science. Remarkably, their students never take standardized tests. All of their teachers are required to have a master's degree. Entry into teaching is highly selective. Only one out of 10 applicants into teacher education is accepted. And it's a highly prestigious profession, as prestigious as any other profession. There are no alternate routes into teaching. There is no Teach for Finland program. And despite the fact that their test scores are higher than ours, I am sure we're not going to be invaded by Finland. <laughs> so consider some of the other elements of our current reform movement. One is merit pay. Merit pay has been tried again and again in our schools since the 1920s. It has never been successful. Economists at the National Center on Performance Incentives at Vanderbilt University decided that they would create the ultimate test of merit pay. They assumed that the reason merit pay had consistently failed was because the bonuses were not big enough. They said that having a bonus of three or four or five thousand dollars was not enough to incentivize those lazy teachers. So they offered a bonus of fifteen thousand dollars for teachers who could raise test scores. And they had an experimental group and a control group. And after a three year trial, they announced in September of 2010 that there was no difference between the two groups and that a bonus of $15,000 made no difference. But when then days after the release of the Vanderbilt study, the U.S. Department of Education announced that it was releasing $500 million for experiments in merit pay with another $500 million to come because, I conclude, evidence doesn't matter. At about the same time, Mayor Bloomberg in New York City decided at the same time as the uh, merit pay program in Nashville was uh, underway, Mayor, Mayor Bloomberg in New York City decided that he would offer a school-wide merit pay plan. And if the scores went up, the whole school would get a bonus, and it would be divided by a committee at each school as they saw fit. Then in 2010, the city abandoned that plan because it made no difference. So Mayor Bloomberg recently declared that he wanted to try a different merit pay plan. This time, he'll offer a $20,000 bonus using the same approach that failed in Nashville. 
Now, charter schools are a central element of this current reform agenda. The basic idea is that public funding for education should be transferred to private corporations who run schools with minimal regulation or oversight. In the 1990s, I supported the charter idea. I testified in Albany for the first charter legislation in New York State. I thought that charters would seek out and help the neediest students and find innovative ways to educate them. The original idea, which was championed by Albert Shanker, who was then the president of the American Federation of Teachers, was that charter schools would collaborate with public schools to solve common problems. But now in the context of No Child Left Behind, charter schools do not collaborate with public schools. Instead, they compete to get higher test scores to say we're better than you are. And when the goal is to get higher test scores, one avoids the neediest students. One avoids the children with disabilities and the children who can't read or speak English because they might drag down your test scores. Charters do not have a secret sauce for producing high test scores. They face the same challenges as ordinary public schools, yet their advocates insist on promoting them as, successful, as a successful reform. Study after study has shown that charters do not get different academic outcomes than regular public schools. Uh, whether one looks at Michigan or Ohio, at Chicago or Detroit, charters do not outperform public schools unless they exclude low-performing students. Given the highly individualistic and deregulated nature of charters, it's not surprising that they vary. Some of them do get high scores, some of them get terrible scores, and most of them do not, on the whole, perform any differently from the regular public schools. And there are public schools that get high scores and public schools get low scores, and so they come out about the same. Charter schools have had a direct impact on Catholic schools in New York City, and I suspect elsewhere as well. As I mentioned earlier, Catholic schools saw a large drop in enrollment from the peak era of the 1960s up to the present. Most people attribute the decline of Catholic enrollments to the rising cost of Catholic education, which was once free in the elementary schools, but now is costly to poor and working families at three to four thousand dollars or more per student. Some attributed to not only the cost, but to the rising cost of labor, now that 97% of staff in Catholic schools consist of laity, and to the suburbanization of many Catholic families. Charter schools have contributed to the decline of Catholic schools because they open in the same neighborhoods and they offer a free education to parents who can barely afford a Catholic education. Just last month, a study of Catholic school enrollments in New York State in New York City was released by Abraham Lackman of the Albany Law School. Abraham Lackman was the staff director of the was the staff director of the State Senate Finance Committee when charter legislation was passed in New York in 1998. Lackman found that the opening of charters was directly related to the closing of Catholic schools. Enrollments in K through six Catholic schools in the state dropped by 46 percent in the last decade. Between 2006 and 2010. 89 Catholic schools closed as 95 charter schools opened. 30% of the children who leave Catholic schools go to charter schools. Every new charter, he says, will draw away 100 students from Catholic schools. As another 280 new charters open in New York State, in response to its Race to the Top award, Catholic schools will see even steeper enrollment declines. Now, vouchers have been promoted as a means of saving students from failing public schools. The Wisconsin legislature approved vouchers for low-income students in Milwaukee in 1990. So there have been vouchers in Milwaukee now for 21 years. Today there are established voucher programs in Milwaukee and also in Cleveland and the District of Columbia. Advocates for vouchers maintain that competition would bring improvement not only for the students in the voucher schools, but for the public schools as well. Uh, they argued that there would be a rising tide that would lift all boats. But this hasn't worked out as planned in Milwaukee because there the low-income students in voucher schools get the same low scores on the state test as low-income students in the public schools. And the voucher schools do no better than the public schools. Furthermore, Milwaukee, Cleveland, and D.C. are the lowest performing districts tested by the federal government on its national assessment of educational progress. Competition did nothing to improve their public schools. Perhaps the worst idea in Race to the Top is that teachers should be evaluated by student test scores. 
Several states have now written this idea into state law. Yours is one of them. Even though there is no evidence that will improve education or even that it will improve test scores. Teachers are going to be judged by whether their students get higher scores on standardized tests as much as the computers think they should. This approach originated in Tennessee where it was developed by William Sanders who was, is, or was an agricultural statistician. Apparently just as wheat grows he thinks that students ought to be growing just as regularly and their scores should grow. His belief is that teachers alone can close the achievement gap irrespective of outside influences. But we know that even wheat requires rain and soil enrichment and not just smart farmers. This approach, now known as value-added assessment, presents a host of problems. Most teachers don't teach reading or math. So the state must create tests for everything so that everyone can be evaluated, so that there can be tests in history, tests in civics, tests in art, tests in music and dance and physical education and on and on with every subject that's taught will be tested. Or if they don't test, if they don't create all of these new tests, they must follow Tennessee's lead and require that teachers of non-tested subjects tie their own fate to the reading or math test of their school even though they don't teach those subjects. So they will be judged on someone else's performance. What's more, the districts that have tried value-added assessment have produced teacher rankings that are inaccurate, unreliable, and unstable. A teacher who is rated effective one year may be ineffective the next year, and vice versa. A teacher may find that she has been rated for a year when she was out on maternity leave, or credited with the scores of students who were not even in her class. The systems are not perfect. The eminent researcher Linda Darling-Hammond of Stanford University says that value-added assessments say more about who is in your class than about your quality as a teacher. Why are student scores not a good measure of teacher quality? The basic rule of testing is that a test should be used only for the purpose for which it was designed. A test of fifth grade reading tests whether fifth graders can read at a fifth grade level. It does not measure teacher quality. It was not designed to measure teacher quality. Student scores are affected by many factors besides the teacher, by their health, their attendance, their home life, their class size, by the resources available to their school, by the actions and the interactions of the teachers they see during the school day, even by the teachers they've had in the past. The teacher has little or no control over many of these factors. New York City created a value-added ranking system for thousands of teachers of math and reading in grades four through eight. The teachers were graded on a curve and compared to other teachers who had similar students. When the media filed a Freedom of Information Act request for the scores and the names of the teachers, the New York City Department of Education, after a court case, uh, released the names of the teachers and their ratings. And these names and ratings were published in the local media. The city's Department of Education warned when, as it released the names and rankings, that the ratings contained a huge margin of error, 35 points in math, 53 points in English language arts. What does that mean? It means that a teacher who was officially rated as a 50 in math might actually be at the 15th percentile or the 85th percentile. In English language arts, it means that a teacher might actually be at the minus third percentile are the plus 103rd percentile. If anyone can explain to me how anyone could be ranked at either of those extremes, I, don't, I would love to know. A math teacher in one of our city's best high schools analyzed the ratings and found there was no correlation between a teacher's rating from one year to the next. There was no correlation between, her, between a, a, a teacher who taught the same subject in two different grades, who might be an effective teacher in sixth grade, but an ineffective teacher in seventh grade and no correlation between the same teacher's score in both English and math, which raises the interesting question of whether you can fire half the teacher and give the, give the other half a bonus. <laughs> Rupert Murdoch's New York Post, which had sued for public disclosure of these ratings, featured a story and a photograph of a teacher and described her in a bold headline as the worst teacher in the city. Reporters hounded her at her apartment. She had to call the police to keep them away. They went to her father's apartment and they asked him, did you know your daughter is the worst teacher in the city, the lowest rated teacher in the city? 
But it later turned out that she teaches English in a highly rated school to new immigrant students. Her students cycle in and out of her class as they learn the language. She can't be rated by this, these methodologies because the students are mobile. Her principal said she is an excellent teacher. She's one of the best in the school, and she would be happy to put her own children in this teacher's class. So as I looked at what happened in New York and at some of the other research that has begun to come out, I conclude that this approach, value-added modeling, value-added assessment, is junk science. Yet many states and districts are now investing many millions of dollars, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars, to create new tests, new tests for students, solely that, so that their teachers can be evaluated. If these ratings, as flawed as they are, are made public, as they were in New York City and in Los Angeles, where a teacher committed suicide after they were released, many people will be humiliated. Across the nation, many teachers are demoralized by all of these actions and attitudes. Last month, the MetLife survey of the American teacher reported that teachers' job satisfaction had fallen precipitously since, since 2009, from 59 percent who were highly satisfied with their job to 44 percent. Worse, it found that nearly one-third of teachers said that they were thinking of quitting. If that happened, that's a million teachers. What kind of a reform movement demoralizes the people who do the daily work of teaching and leading schools? What kind of a business would berate its employees and measure their performance in invalid ways? What kind of a business would publish its employees' ratings in the media? There was just the other day a story in the Huffington Post about a survey in California that said that 66 percent of the public liked the idea that teacher ratings were made public. And I felt that the survey was missing one important question. Would you like your job rating to be published in the newspaper? I don't think they would. I think what we're seeing is classic scapegoating. None of this makes any sense. If we look to the highest performing nations in the world, whether Finland or Japan or Korea or Singapore, we don't see them applying untested, unproven, and harmful demeaning methods of teacher evaluation. What we see instead is a conscientious and thoughtful program to recruit good students into teaching, to prepare them well, to support them once they're in the classroom, and then to respect their professionalism. We don't do any of this. We will lose many excellent teachers as a consequence. What's missing today from the national discourse are the values that are deeply embedded in Catholic education. I speak now of respect for teachers and respect for students. I speak of the teacher who looks on each child as a unique individual. I refer to the recognition that education is a mission a determination to help other human beings and to improve society. In the public system, other values have been imposed, values that require teachers to rank their students by their scores and see them in comparison to others rather than as unique individuals. Idealism is far more powerful as a source of motivation than carrots and sticks, and yet so many of the reforms of our day are based on carrots and sticks. Most people who become educators do so because they have a desire to make a difference in the lives of children, not a desire to get rich. Anyone who becomes a teacher hoping to get rich doesn't belong to be in the classroom. They're not wise. <laughs> Today's business-minded reformers don't understand this motivation. They seem convinced that educators and children must be incentivized by promises of money or threats of punishment. Cognitive science today says they're wrong. There's a very good review of today's cognitive science in Daniel Pink's book, Drive, in Dan Ariely's book, Predictably Irrational, in Edward Detchy's book, Why We Do What We Do. And what all of these writers say is that paying people to do what they want to do undermines their performance that the best way to get high performance is to appeal to a sense of idealism, to a sense of mission, to a sense of purpose, and to give people the autonomy to do what they want to do and give them the training and support to do it well. I support public education because I believe that a decent society must have a strong public sector, one committed to equity and justice. 
I support Catholic education because Catholic schools are committed to equity and justice within the Catholic tradition. Catholic schools should not become charters because to do so they must forfeit their Catholic identity. I fear that vouchers too will eventually subject Catholic schools to the same demands and pressures that are now harming public education. Is there any hope for Catholic education? Yes, there is. Catholic education must remain true to itself. It must remain a living exemplar of moral and ethical education. As a Jew, I say advisedly, it must keep the crucifixes on the walls. It must remain God-centered. It must look not for public subsidy, but must vie for the billions of philanthropic dollars now poured into ill-considered and ultimately futile experiments in education. Seek out the funders who want to do what is right. Seek out those who look for a proven remedy and not for pie in the sky. Is there any hope for public education? I am convinced that there is because I believe the current wave of bad ideas will fall of its own weight. As the experiments continue to fail, its funders will discover that high test scores can't be purchased by intimidating teachers. As they learn that high scores are not necessarily the same as good education, they will lose interest. And when that day arrives, as I believe it will, our nation will be ready to face the genuine problems of our schools, our society, and our nation's children and families. And in that not too distant time, I hope that we will once again recognize that education, whether it occurs in public schools or Catholic schools or independent schools, is a slow and incremental process of human development. It cannot be changed by silver bullets, by overnight reforms, by tough management, by incentives, by bonuses, or any of that sort of thing. And in, when that day comes, we will recognize that sound education policies must be supportive, must be collaborative, must respect the human person, and must not be punitive or based on threats and rewards. They must be based on respect, respect for educators, for families, and for children. So tonight, I urge you to support Catholic schools and to keep them Catholic, and do not rely on the state to save them. Recognize that Catholic schools and public schools are allies, not opponents, and that the survival and health of both systems is in the best interest of our society. Thank you very much. I'll be very happy to answer your questions. And I think there may be, does someone have a microphone here? Yes, there's a microphone here and over here. Yes. Um, I have a daughter who is a special ed teacher in a public school system. She's outstanding. She's excellent with the students that she works with. But she's one of your demoralized teachers. She's really good at what she does, and it, and it breaks my heart that she's talking now about leaving the system trying to find some other work, and, and I, I'm, I, it makes me very fearful. I mean, I know you sounded kind of hopeful at the end, but, you know, what's going to, you know, what's the aftermath of what's happening in the meantime, you know, until hopefully we've reached that recognition. Okay. Did you all hear the question? No. Okay. Um, this uh, woman down, down front said that her daughter is a special ed teacher in public schools, and she's one of those demoralized teachers who is feeling as though she might leave and look for other work because it's, it's such a terribly uh, difficult time to be a teacher and that uh, all of this pounding on teachers has undermined her feeling of, of efficacy. Would you say that's right? Yeah, I and and what, what does she do in the meanwhile until all of this falls apart? And, and she sees her school moving toward this teaching to the test thing. And with her students, it's horrible because they're, you know, they're made to feel bad because they are, as special ed teachers, are not reaching. Sure. Well, and, and her students feel particularly bad because she is a special ed teacher and because so much is teaching to the test and judging students by scores that her, her students will never be at the top and will never feel that they're successful. And as part of what is, uh, I think, very, um, um, I'm trying to think of a kind way to say this, it's very sick what we're doing, actually. 
uh, because the nature of a standardized test is that it's a norm test, and half the kids are always going to be in the bottom, and half the kids are always going to feel that they're failure, uh, and the ones who are just above that mean are not going to feel very successful either. So we're in effect by imposing, and many of you may not even remember a time when there were no standardized tests. Uh, I'm old enough to remember those days where teachers actually made their own test and students did get honest grades and, and people made judgments and helped kids and, and it wasn't that it was utopia, uh, but we were not subjected to this constant ranking and grading and measuring and, and putting people in a row and who's, who's worst and who's best. Is, and then the same kids always end up being in the bottom half. Uh, so what hope is there? I think the hope is that it's going to be not going to happen right away. I think that it's going to take a lot of organization and mobilization by people who see that this is wrong. Uh, I believe that the ultimate hope of changing all of this is an aware public, which is why I spend a great deal of time traveling and speaking, trying to raise public consciousness of how ineffective and how useless and how harmful so much of this agenda is, uh, how, um, I don't like to get personal, but I think that your superintendent, Tony Bennett, is one of those leading the charge in the wrong direction. Uh, but I could say the same thing about Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Louisiana. <laughs> and I think the hope is that an aroused public will change this because so many people are beginning to see uh, that this is wrong. Uh, a lot of this started in Texas, and uh, No Child Left Behind came from Texas. We heard when George W. Bush was elected president about the Texas miracle. Now we know there was no Texas miracle. So this whole law is based on what was essentially a campaign uh, you know, promise. People say all sorts of things in campaigns that they don't expect anyone to take seriously. <laughs> and now we have a national education policy blame, uh, that's based on this campaign claim but there is a, an anti-high-stakes testing rebellion that has taken root in Texas. They are now out of about 1,000 school districts in Texas. About uh, 230 have already taken a, passed a resolution. The school boards have passed a resolution against the high-stakes testing. The state commissioner of education called high-stakes testing the vampire that's eating our system. He said it's all about feeding the education industrial complex. Uh, Texas is putting out there, they've cut for $13 billion from their schools over the past several years. At the same time, they're paying $500 million to the testing company, Pearson. Uh, they haven't cut the testing budget. But you now have the state commissioner on record saying this is wrong. A uh, growing number of school boards, I gather that in the next day or two, Dallas is going to become the biggest school board to pass this resolution. There's going to be a national move for school boards across the country to uh, adopt a similar resolution saying enough is enough. Let's start talking about what's real education and stop warping everything by this uh, uh, ranking and rating and use test in their proper perspective. We don't, we're not using them appropriately. Uh, but I think you'll see more of that. And so I think there is hope because there's growing awareness. Uh, a third of the principals in New York State signed a petition against the teacher evaluation system. Um, it's moving forward, but I think that as these systems begin to be implemented, they become ridiculous. I mean, you, if you look at what happened in New York City, that was a ridiculous outcome where you had people being rated in ways that uh, were patently absurd. So the, more and more, as the public becomes aware, you will begin to see a change. And you're here tonight, and you're going to become more active tomorrow because of what you've learned tonight. And that'll make the change, because this is still a democracy. Uh, I'm a reading, uh, remedial reading class and for freshmen where some of my students are reading like first and second grade level and um, just this week the, t the scores are coming back from Indiana's I read test in third grade and uh, you know the numbers are just coming back and I'm all for making sure kids can read so they're not freshmen in high school. It, you know, it would deal, and I have, I'm dealing with what I'm dealing with, and these poor kids can't read the textbooks. But this other extreme of testing them in third grade, and then, then they're going to hold them back if they don't pass. And what do you see with reading? Reading to me is the most essential question here. What would ensure? Well, the mo the most important thing we can do in terms of changing that would be to surround kids with the services they need in the earliest years. 
to have early childhood education so that when children first get to kindergarten, they already have an awareness of you know, what letters are, what books are, how to hold a book, uh, and so that they know about the social skills they need. There are so many things that kids need. Just on the first day of school, there's already an achievement gap. So early childhood education, but then as kids in the early grades need the diagnostic attention of specialists so that those kinds of reading problems are dealt with at the very beginning because when they're not dealt with at the beginning, the kids fall farther and farther behind. Uh, earlier this spring, I spoke to the National Association of School Psychologists, and the president of that organization said in his remarks to the group, he said that children today have three great fears. The greatest is that they'll lose a parent, and the second is that they'll go blind, and the third is that they'll be held back in school because that's so humiliating. And what we know from reams of research is that when children are held back, uh, it increases their likelihood of dropping out of school very dramatically. So I think that rather than having these punitive, you're going to be held back policy, we should give kids the help they need when they need it early on. And it'll, it'll cost more, but it'll save more in the long run. Diane, thanks for coming. I had an opportunity last week to take a group of principals to some of the, the best faith-based schools I've ever seen in, in Milwaukee. Um, these were Lutheran schools and Catholic schools that are taking advantage of the voucher, where they've had it for about 20 years. They've had the opportunity to take their kids to a Catholic school or a Lutheran school or some other faith-based school. And, um, they don't see, the school leaders that we talked to don't see any evidence of what you talked about. So I'd love to hear you talk more about, you said there, you have a fear that vouchers would make Catholic schools open to the problems that public schools are facing. And I'd love to hear more about that in a place like Milwaukee where you have a, a group of parents in a community, like the largest Catholic school in the country, St. Anthony's is in Milwaukee, they have 1,600 kids, pre-K to 11, all low income, and all on the path to college and heaven. Um, what, is, you know, what is the fear there for, for what the vouchers might do, and, and, and what's your concern about, about that spreading to other states? Well, you know, the, I think that when you have uh, one group of politicians in power, they may keep hands off, but there may be another group that comes along. As in Louisiana, the debate down there was that the uh, someone who had been on the State Board of Education said those schools getting vouchers have to be subject to the same kinds of requirements as the public schools. Now, I don't know whether any of that got into the law, but certainly the feeling is there that they have to be tested in the same way and they have to be subject to the same rules and regulations. Uh, so to the extent that uh, the government keeps hands off, that's fine. But I think that there will, there will be a different party in power eventually, or a different point of view in power, and there is a risk uh, that when they say you have to have the same testing regulations, no child left behind now applies to you as well. Uh, then you may find that the Catholic schools and the other faith-based schools are subject to the same kinds of issues. Uh, but, you know, the, the larger picture of Milwaukee is that it's a terribly low-performing city and that the voucher schools don't do any better. And there, it's like with charters. There are some of them that got wonderful scores. Most of them got pretty awful scores. So for the low-income students who got the vouchers uh, on the whole, they didn't do any better than the low-income students in the, in the regular public schools. So it was not a salvation for them. Uh, and, and, you know, with any one of these uh, approaches, whether it's charters or vouchers, you will find some that do well, some that do terribly. But you want to look for a more systemic response. And I think that the other thing, and I think Milwaukee may or may not be an example of this, is uh, with Milwaukee, the requirement was low income. Uh, in many places where vouchers are proposed, it's low performing so that the kids who will be sent to the faith-based schools will be the lowest performing. They'll be coming from failing schools, and I'm not sure that that saves Catholic education. But we'll, we'll see. Hi, Diane. Um, first of all, love your blazer. Um, <laughs> and uh, second, um, you've been talking about how you, like, what you appreciate about the Catholic school system, especially like how they aim at um, educating the entire child and then getting back to like what is the real education um, which are all good ideas but they all seem kind of nebulous to me how they would work in like large-scale practice outside of a, a religious establishment so I was wondering what you think policies places in those kind of ideas and I guess besides um, cutting the programs for like 
um, like testing what would policymakers be doing in your opinion? Uh, visiting in Finland, that was pretty much what their national system is. Uh, and they were not always people, m many people say, well, Finland, you know, they're all, it's homogeneous, it's their Nordic country and so forth. But Finland changed its educational system about 30 years ago. And uh, the, the countries surrounding it, which have the same demo demographics as Finland, are not high performing. Uh, Norway, Sweden, uh, Switzerland, Denmark, they are not at the top. Finland got to the top by doing a few things that we haven't done. One is that it made uh, teaching a very prestigious profession, made it very difficult to become a teacher, and then those who be wanted to be teachers had to go through a, a rigorous preparation program. Uh, so they have very well prepared teachers, uh, and uh, you know, five years is the, the training program. The other thing that they have done very conscientiously is to reduce poverty. Only 4% of their kids are, live in poverty, and in this country it's more than 20%. Uh, amongst African American students is over 35 percent. So when you ignore poverty and say that the schools are going to solve the problem, that's just not realistic. You have to have in a country, in order to have any kind of decent um, equity and justice, you have to have an approach to reducing poverty, giving people a better start in life. Uh, the, even with low poverty, Finland has health clinics or doctors or nurses attached to every school so the children are very well uh, you know, they're, they're, they're in good health, they have good nutrition. Every child in the country, regardless of their income, has uh, a hot meal every day and, and finish schools. We don't do that. I mean, there's so many things that we could do to make the lives of children better that we don't do. And uh, they don't do standardized testing. Uh, they, when I asked them, how do you hold teachers accountable, they said, well, we don't have that word in our educational vocabulary, accountability. Our, our term is responsibility. And our teachers are professional, they're very responsible. I have found it very bizarre to see s state legislatures passing laws about how to evaluate teachers because as a general rule, there's no one in any, any of the state legislatures who understands anything about teaching. How can they possibly pass laws about how to evaluate teachers? They don't pass laws about how to evaluate doctors. Now, but seriously, can you imagine the Indiana legislature passing a law about how to evaluate doctors and lawyers? I mean, they're lawyers. Why would they do that? <laughs> uh, so I think that it isn't just a matter of deregulation. It's a matter of having, first of all, a very clear sense about good education and that a good education requires the sciences and math and, of course, reading and writing the basics, but it also includes the arts and history and physical education and attending to the needs of children. It's, it's a balance between social responsibility and, and good education and allowing teachers, uh, first of all, to be well prepared, to give them the support they need, and then allowing them to act as professionals. We don't allow teachers to act as professionals. We're constantly piling mandates on schools and on teachers, and most of those mandates don't make schools better and don't make education better. Yes. Oh, sorry, I have the mic. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, 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 um, let's, let's say there's a situation where a principal has um, found that there's a certain teacher in their school that they believe is incompetent. And let's, you know, let's leave test scores out of it. They just, based on what they see, this person should not be around kids. And let's stipulate this person is very nice and that they have all the best in t intentions by entering the teaching profession, but they just should not be around kids. I guess my question is, would you want somebody that you love to be taught by this individual? Uh, I think, first of all, that most every state has a period in which uh, principals and uh, department chairs and so forth make a judgment about whether a teacher is competent to have due process rights. For the first three or four years in every state that I know of, they have that time to observe the teacher and make a decision about whether they're competent as teachers. If they feel they're not, then they don't get it's called tenure, but it isn't really tenure, it's just due process rights. There is actually tremendous turnover in the teaching profession, uh, partly because we have such low standards for entry into teaching. But uh, about 40% of everyone who enters teaching is gone within the first five years. So it's not that we don't have enough people exiting. Uh, we, we really need to, we don't have the support systems to keep the good people and to, and to hold on to them and train them properly. But if someone gets due process rights, first of all, they, it's a very bad administrator if it was an incompetent person who was given 
the right to a hearing. I mean, all due process rights means is that if they decide you're incompetent, they have to give you a hearing. Now, if the hearing takes too long, if it takes years, there's something wrong with the, you know, whatever agreements were made, and they should be renegotiated. It takes two to make an agreement. But I think that having a hearing is not exactly an, an un-American idea. It strikes me that people should have the right to a hearing, especially if they've been told by their administrators that they are competent and that they have been, uh, you know, they qualify to have due process. Uh, but then the due process ought to be something that's done in a timely fashion so that they hear the evidence against them. If they're incompetent, if they're given help and they don't improve, then they should be removed. Thank you for, for coming this evening. Could you say a little more uh, about um, this business of testing, and I use the word business intentionally, uh, Who's making money on this expensive enterprise, and who's holding them accountable for the quality of their product? Well, the uh, testing industry is uh, fairly concentrated. Right now it's dominated by two companies, Pearson and McGraw-Hill. There are a few others, but it's mostly those two. Pearson, which is an English company, holds contracts across this country, probably more than any other country company. Uh, and it's making a lot of money. It has a $500 million contract in Texas, a $500 million contract in New York, a huge contract in Florida. Uh, I don't know what other states it has, but it has lots of them. It's obviously a very lucrative business. Uh, one of the chief lobbyists for Pearson was the architect of No Child Left Behind. So, yeah, there is, there is a lot of money being made. I, I would have to say that it's not just the testing industry, although it's that, because they're selling all the test prep materials. They're selling lots of other supplementary materials for the testing. But it's also, and I alluded to this, the, the, uh, the virtual charter industry, which troubles me very much. Uh, I, you probably have some of them in Indiana. K-12 is one. Connections Academy is another. Um, they do, spend a lot of money on advertising, enroll students. And within a year, 50% of the students are gone. And they return to the public school, but the money stays with the charter. Uh, so it's a, it's a high turnover business. The kids get terrible results. Uh, just judged by test scores, which is the metric of the day, their scores are very low. Uh, the, the attrition rates are very high. The graduation rates are very low. There's been study after study in Ohio and Pennsylvania and Colorado. And uh, these are big money-making businesses. K-12, which is the biggest of the online charter companies, had over $500 million in revenues last year. <coughs> Their CEO was paid $5 million, not exactly what you'd pay your district superintendent. Uh, but it's big business, and they, they are spreading into state after state, and they, uh, they offer very little educationally, as far as I can see. Yes, in, in front here. Yeah. And how do you how do you get them out at this point in time? Because you talk about lobbyists, you talk about the <coughs> decision that a corporation is treated like an individual and can give all that money. They have all the money to give. Teachers don't have a lot of money. Right. So the question is, how do you get the politicians out of education? <coughs> well, I think that's one of the great virtues of the Catholic school system right now is that you are independent. And so uh, this is why I said stay away from the state, because even though it's very enticing to think that uh, state money might be able to float the Catholic schools, uh, eventually public, uh, the politicians want to change the rules. They want to impose regulations. That happens. How do you get them out? I think it's going to be a, a process of uh, showing that what they're doing now is not working. Uh, and at this point, I'm, I'm really fed up with people who say, I was just reading yesterday that someone running in uh, San Diego says she's going to fix the schools in her first term. How do you do that? What politician in their right mind, what mayor, what governor has the nerve to say they're going to fix the schools? They're not in the schools, so what are they going to do? They're going to uh, pick up one of these quick fixes and mess things up even more. So I think that uh, we have to begin to work towards a day, and it will, be, it will not happen overnight. Uh, change never does. 
at least no good changes do, but bad things don't last forever. Uh, when I visited Helsinki right before that, I was in Berlin and was reminded that in the center of Berlin was this terrible, ugly scar, which I saw in the 1980s called the Berlin Wall. And now there's no trace of it. It's gone. The Nazis came and went. The communists came and went. The Berlin Wall fell. And these things didn't happen by themselves. They happened because people work towards a better day. So what I want to encourage you to do is um, don't, I know it's a very discouraging scene at the moment, but you've got to elect better people to public office, people who care about public education, people who have a vision of how to change the lives of children and families and improve our schools without mucking them up. Uh, so there's a lot of work ahead of us all. Thank you very much for inviting me here tonight. Well, it's my privilege to be able to invite all of you out to a reception which is taking place right out in the atrium here and again uh, in an environment that is so characterized by uh, polarizing rhetoric. It's so refreshing to have someone of Diane's learned disposition and her background come and, and uh, make a passionate appeal for reasoned reform that really focuses on children and teachers. Thank you and God bless you. Huh?